the American food system. Um, I'm just going to start with this because it's got a little bit of video and some relevant stuff in here. So check this out. So here's what Kelly Means has to say. And this guy is a former Coke executive. The tobacco industry created the ultra processed food industry. They shifted scientists to make the food addictive and shifted their lobbyists to convince the USDA to tell us this crap is safe. When will we stop falling for this? And so here he is talking about this on Dr. Tobacco Bill. companies as smoking went down actually started buying Nabisco and Kraft and shifting their scientists over. The key thing that the food companies know is that ultra processed food, which is now up to 70% of our diet, is a science experiment. They're hijacking our evolutionary biology and they're making the food addictive. And working for the food companies, the first part of the devil bargain is making that food normalized. So we paid the USDA uh, advisors 95% of the folks that make our nutrition guidelines are directly paid for by food companies. That means the USDA recommends added sugar for two-year-olds. They say up to, up to 10% of a two-year-old's diet should be added sugar. We pay the lawmakers themselves. We pay the regulatory agencies. Uh, literally, the American Diabetes Association sets, sets the standard of care for diabetes, accepts money from Coca-Cola. So we first, we normalize this addiction crisis. When you do a brain scan of a person eating ultra processed food, it fits all the criteria for addiction and we've gotten people addicted. Okay. So let me get this straight. You're saying that the major beverage companies, food companies, all of them are bribing the scientists, bribing the regulatory agencies to endorse their formulas, their ingredients for food to say that they're good, say that they're okay. And in fact, those ingredients are meant to addict people to the foods that they're selling. It's the express purpose. Interesting stuff. Um, and Callie actually has receipts for, for a lot of this. So I'm gonna show you this other clip from him. Well, it's not a clip actually, it's a, it's a tweet. But I like to bring receipts, so check this out. In 1988, Philip Morris bought Kraft, forming the world's largest food producer. Three of the four largest mergers in the 1980s were cigarette companies purchasing food companies. Processed food is quite literally a science experiment from the cigarette industry designed to addict us. The explicit goal of these mergers was to shift scientists from the tobacco department's declining industry to the processed food department's growth industry. And this is why, again, it's I love capitalism, but this is part of our psyche. It's all about money. And this, it's, I mean, this is unsurprising when you, when you dig into the fact that, you know, we're, we're basically being poisoned and put on a treadmill of poisonous foods and pharmaceuticals, but it's not surprising because this pattern, you see it in everything, in any industry that has money, you see this, but let's keep going. They then use the same legal and PR playbooks to buy off research saying these new food connections were safe and even get the government to subsidize and recommend it. Let's not forget government agencies said cigarettes were safe throughout the 1960s and 70s and tobacco is still government subsidized today. On the food side, 90% of ag agriculture subsidies go to ultra processed food, which is killing us. The 1990s food pyramid led to an explosion of processed food in the American diet. And today, the USDA still recommends added sugar to toddlers. Frequently, doctors and nutrition experts have attacked me for oversimplifying the reasons for the chronic disease epidemic. I would submit they are overcomplicating it. We do not need more studies. We don't need more conferences. We don't need more reports. We need to, as a matter of public policy, reduce processed food as a percentage of our diet. You could say processed food is the new cigarette but this would not be fair to cigarettes. It's much deadlier. And here's the article from October 31st of 1988 from the Los Angeles Times, Kraft to be sold to Philip Morris for 13.1 billion. Kraft Inc. said Sunday, it agreed to be acquired by Philip Morris Co's for 13.1 billion or $106 per share in what would be the nation's largest non-oil merger ever. Now, I wanna go back to something he said here a little bit earlier. Um, where he said, we don't need more studies. We don't need more conferences. We don't need more reports. This right here is the tactic, the political tactic 
that has been used if you pay attention throughout history. It's called stalling. And it's incrementalism, basically. It's what the Democrats have been doing for the last 30 years. Oh, well, we can't do that much. Like, we'll give... We'll give you health care, but we'll make sure it's like a big handout to, you know, health insurance and pharmaceutical companies. And then it doesn't work. Oh, well, you know, maybe we can do this, but we got to be careful. This dynamic is you see it in the news. I was just watching, uh, you know, we'll talk about this in a minute, but I was watching Max Blumenthal talking about how now the New York Times and the Washington Post and all the mainstream media outlets are acknowledging reporting that the gray zone was doing months ago. And this, uh, you know, I already said this indie news is like indie music where the good stuff is on the underground and it doesn't bubble up to the surface till like six months later. But that's why, because the mainstream media is, is using this stalling tactic. They know what's going on, but if they stall and pretend that they don't have the facts yet and we got to do more studies, we got to do more research, we got to make sure that we're coming correct before then they can stall and and drag this out longer and the, you know the companies that profit from it continue to you know profit and and suffer no recourse and you again you see it with the war machine where it's like you know the kind of stuff that's just now making it to the new york times we've known people like us who watch indie media have known since like november of last year you know um there's a treadmill basically, right? So we're being sold this, this poisonous food and it's f***ing up our bodies. And then we're being kind of routed into this treadmill of drugs and, you know, statins is a good example. Uh, and, and, uh, Callie here, it, it talks about it a lot. And I think, uh, Asim Mahathra, another one of the doctors who is, who is skeptical of the pandemic narrative, has said that like these drugs really almost do nothing. There's studies that show they almost do nothing, but they're widely prescribed because you know it's pushed by big industry. And again, when it comes to this stuff, you know, it's not black and white. Pharm I, I mean, I can fully admit pharmaceutical companies have done a lot of great things. You know, a lot of capitalist, you know, for-profit companies have made a lot of incredible breakthroughs. You you can't deny that. But that also doesn't give them license to completely all of us. And uh, I want you to check out the obvious next kind of step in this progression. So this is Callie talking to Tucker about Ozempic. And two years after the very public failure of the COVID vaccines, that more people in this country would be skeptical of brand new pharma products. And maybe they are, but they don't seem very skeptical of Ozempic, which is a diabetes drug that apparently, at least in the short term, can help people lose weight. And on one level, you can see why they're not skeptical. This is a very fat country. That's a huge problem. And a lot of people, a lot of us, wouldn't mind losing 20 pounds by taking a pill. So why shouldn't we? Well, we thought it'd be interesting to hear the other side, a side that you were not hearing on the question of Ozempic from someone who knows a lot about it. Callie Means is the founder of TrueMed. He once worked for pharma. He definitely does not now. And he joins us today in studio. Kelly, thanks so much for coming on. Pumped to be here, Tucker. So you want to lose 20, and I'm speaking from experience. So one of the things about our culture too is, is this culture of convenience. You know, people don't want to have to work out. People don't want to be told, hey, if you want to lose weight, exercise and eat better. Um, they want to take a magic pill that's going to fix it. You know, just like you want to, I don't want to cook food. I want to roll through a drive through window and have someone hand it to me. And that is is the mentality we have to get away from a little bit now, not completely, you know, I, I I'm not against convenience or technology, but I, I speak from personal experience where I was pre-diabetic and, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty healthy. Like I've exercised regularly for a long time, but I got to a point where my own health issues became such a thing that I, I started really digging into things, you know, pre-diabetic blood pressure problems. And of course, you know, the medical industry wants to go, oh, well, you have high blood pressure. Here's some pills to take for that. But luckily for me, I was already a skeptic and I went, no, 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 no. I'm going to try to solve this problem naturally. I'm going to look at the things I'm doing and change them. And rather than do that, it's so much easier to sell pills. But 
you should watch this whole interview, but I'm just going to play a little bit at the beginning of it because it's a nice top off for what we've been talking about. It's, you want to lose 20 pounds. You don't really want to stop eating pizza. This seems like a super quick way to get healthier. Um, why wouldn't you take Ozempic? Why shouldn't I take Ozempic? There's three big reasons Ozempic is very problematic. And I think really the Rosetta Stone to understanding what's gone wrong in healthcare and frankly, pharma industry corruption. The first point I want to make is that if a fish tank is dirty, you clean the tank. You don't drug the fish. And in America right now- <laughs> So they won't notice. <laughs> in America right now, we've got a very dirty tank. 50% uh, of teens and 80% of adults are overweight. And this has happened in just a generation. We didn't become systematically lazier in the past generation as Americans and frankly suicidal. Um, something has happened. And the core mistake of Ozempic is that Obesity is not an ozempic deficiency. Obesity is not the root cause of the problem. Obesity is one branch of the tree of underlying metabolic dysfunction that's ravaging our country. Um, as we talked about, with over 50% of Americans having prediabetes now, 33% of, of young Wait, adults- most Americans have prediabetes? Oh, it's by some measures, is up to 60. I was one of them. I was one of them. Percent. Of the whole country? Uh, of adults and 33% of young adults and teens. And you have a diabetes doctor, you know, just a generation ago, wouldn't see one child in their entire careers uh, with diabetes. Now, diabetes, which, which again is cellular dysfunction, is cellular disruption, um, totally caused by environmental factors and what we're eating. That's, um, that's close to becoming, right, uh, upwards of 50% of kids. It's 33% and growing radically. Um, teens, uh, 25% have fatty liver disease, which is something you only used to see in elderly alcoholics. So there's a, there's a metabolic health crisis, um, that's caused by decisions, right? The USDA, which is completely corrupt, the guidelines that set nutrition standards, 95% of the guideline committee is paid for by food companies. They say that a two-year-old, that 10% of their diet could be added sugar. We have more money from agriculture subsidies in America today, go to cigarettes, go to tobacco than vegetables, 90% of subsidies go to highly processed food. We've propped this industry up. Uh, food stamps, right, which 15% of Americans depend on for nutrition. So I want to stop right there for a second because what he's saying is true. And if you study the science around this, which I did a little bit because it was a problem I was having, the added sugar in our diets, and it's in everything. I had to like cut my diet back to salad and meat and eggs, basically, to lose any weight whatsoever because we're constantly in a state of what's called insulin resistance because of all the added sugar in our diets. And when you get in that state of insulin resistance, you don't lose fat. Your body is storing fat. So the keto diet, the principle of it is to eat foods that are, you know, protein heavy and more, you know, because listen, people have all kinds of little debates about keto and whether it's valid or not. But what it really boils down to, what's good about keto diet is it forces you to cut out a lot of the added sugar and the processed sugars in your diet. And eat, and and you don't ha even have to do this completely. Look, I still eat pizza sometimes. A lot of times I make it myself. I, I, I get a good dough, you know, from an Italian bakery. And then I put my own sauce in, or get in some sauce and put it together myself. So there's not because when you buy from fast food companies, they spray with all these like chemical butters and all this stuff like that. So just by like making your own food and kind of having a little bit more control over what goes into your body, you can, you can change things dynamically.